Let's take our Bibles this morning and turn in them to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9, I want to focus our attention this morning on the final verses of this chapter, verses 30 to 33. Romans chapter 9, verses 30 to 33. The Apostle Paul says, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer as we begin our time? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment in our lives. We are patently aware of our need for you to help us understand. You are a gracious God, a faithful God, a loving and kind God, a God of justice, a God who must punish sin, a God of wrath. And we understand those realities about you, and yet here we are this day as your people to hear from you, to get to understand you even more and to know the reality and the majesty and the wonder of your salvation. Lord, we pray this morning in our dependence upon you that you would indeed meet with us. Allow your spirit to be upon us, in us, through us, so that we would understand these things as you would have us understand them. That we would know what you mean by what you say, and that we would be able to put these things into practice in our own hearts, in our own minds, in our own lives, and throughout our Christian life here, that we might fulfill exactly what you have commanded us to do, and that is to proclaim this truth to others, that all may know of you that you would receive the glory in all things. This we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we ended last Lord's Day in Romans chapter 9 with the reading of verses 27 to 29. They are both sobering and yet they are comforting words. I think it would be appropriate for us once again just to Read those again where we left off last Lord's Day. Isaiah cries out concerning Israel in verse 27, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute His word upon the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left to us a posterity, we would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. Now, if you've been here throughout our study, as most of you have been, you remember from the Old Testament the promises that God had made to Abraham. He had promised Abraham that his descendants would be like, as Isaiah quotes here, the sand of the sea. Now, I've lived in California. I grew up there as a young boy. I often went to the beach. I lived a few years in Florida. And I like to go to the beach and walk on the sand. And yet every time I have been to the shore of any ocean throughout the world... I've never attempted to count the grains of sand. How could anyone come to any kind of number that is so numerous? 
few years ago, my wife and I, when we were spending some time down in the Caribbean, we scuba dived. Some of you have talked to me about that and said that's the most frightening thing I could ever think of doing. My wife and I were under about 30 feet of water in the ocean. And you know what I found under there? More sand. A lot of it. Now that's simply to say that the sand of the sea is innumerable. Only God knows how many grains there are. Only God knows exactly what the sea is made up by way of its sandiness. And so when we read these words in verse 27, we get a greater understanding when we just sit and ponder that for a moment as to God's promise to Abraham concerning his descendants. They would be as the sand of the sea. In other words, Abraham, you were going to have an innumerable amount of dependence. And yet, the final phrase of that very verse and that text in Isaiah causes us to take a deep breath. Because the final phrase says, it is the remnant that will be saved. Abraham, you are going to have descendants that are like the sand of the oceans of the world in number, and yet, it is only the remnant that will be saved. The word remnant is an interesting word in the original language. It it, it just simply means this, what is left behind? What is left behind? I was thinking about that this week and thinking, how can I illustrate that so that we get an idea? What is the amount of what is left behind? What is that amount? Well, let me see if I can illustrate it in a simple way. This morning when you woke up, some of you may have had a piece of toast for breakfast. Took a piece of bread, you stuck it in the toaster, you warmed that toast up till it got brown, you stuck it on a plate, you put whatever spread you liked on it, or maybe you liked it as dry toast. Consider that piece of toast representing the whole number of the descendants, the sea of the sand, the sand of the sea, descendants of Abraham. Consider that for a moment as you think about this in just a simple kind of way. The whole piece are the descendants. The remnant is what was left behind after you ate that toast on the plate that you washed off into the sink. The crumbs, what was left behind the smallest part, the insignificant part, the part you didn't even think of, the part that was just like trash. And so in the context of what Isaiah was saying to Israel and what Paul is quoting here to those whom he is writing, i.e., for the most part, his brethren, his Jewish brethren who are struggling with the reality of how God saves and God being sovereign in salvation, The context is this. Don't think that God is going to save everybody. Don't ever get that in your mind. Don't think that God in some way in His godness is obligated to save all that He has ever created. It is only the crumbs that He is saving. And then verse 28 says, For the Lord will execute His word upon the earth thoroughly, And quickly. Remember last Lord's Day as we were ending our time and kind of pondering on this thing, we we understood that God, the implication from verse 28 is this to the Jews and to everyone else who has ever walked the face of the earth, God has given enough time for you to believe. God has given you a history of time for you to believe. In the history of the earth, the history of the creation of the world, regardless of however long you think the world has existed by, the, by way of whatever science has tried to tell us, which is foolishness in my mind in reference to what God has said, God has given, either way, plenty of time for you to believe. And when the day comes for Him to judge, as 
Psalm 98 says. When the day comes for His judgment to come and for Him to carry out His righteous justice upon vessels of dishonor, it will be quick and it will be thorough. Now, for us here this morning, that ought to be a sobering thought. That ought to be a sobering thought. Only the crumbs will be saved. There's enough time to believe. And when God judges, it will be quick and it will be thorough. And that is a sobering thought if, if, if you will accept your condition before God. It is a sobering thought to anyone in humanity if you realize and understand and accept the reality of your condition. What is that? What is your condition? Same condition we all are prior to our salvation if we're saved at all. And for those who aren't saved, we are all in a condition of guilt before God. That is our condition. In other words, God, as I said, is not obligated to save anybody. Remember back in the previous verses when he's talking about giving us that metaphor of developing and forming those who are honorable and those who are dishonorable out of this lump of clay? The entire lump of clay is humanity, fallen humanity. That's our condition. We are not in a neutral zone. We are not in some zone by which we can make effort toward Being good enough for God to accept us, there is none of that that can happen. God, by His sovereign choice, chooses to form some, the crumbs, for honorable use, and the rest are dishonorable. That's our condition. God is not obligated to save us. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. No, not one. Now, that is truly sobering. That is truly sobering if we as humans will just think about it. And we would have no comfort in that news unless God had said and done more. It would be entirely a completely devastating and utterly completely sobering thought to the death of us if God didn't do something else. If that was the only news we had. In other words, Paul's saying to his Jewish brethren and to us, in light of the sobering truth of verses 27 and 28, in light of the sobering reality that while for Abraham his descendants would be like the sand of the sea, yet only the crumbs would be saved, in light of that reality, I am eternally grateful for the comfort of verse 29. Just as Isaiah foretold, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us, left to us a posterity, we would have become as Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. So let us not miss what Isaiah is saying to Israel and what the Apostle Paul is saying to the Jews of his day and what God is saying through Paul to all of us sitting right here this morning. Let us not miss it. Notice, verse 29 begins with the word, except. Don't don't read these verses too quickly when you're studying them. Don't, Don't just breeze by them and say, oh yeah, that's a quote from Isaiah, great, let's move on. Don't do that in your own Bible study. Sit a while and think. Think about what is being said. It begins with the word, except, or some of your translations might say, unless. It really doesn't matter what word is there in that sense. The idea is the same. The idea is this. If somebody didn't do something for you and for me who are guilty before God, then we would be just like the cities mentioned in that verse. And we all know that story from Genesis chapter 19. You go back and read it in your own time of study, even after our service today, today, 
and read about what took place and why God judged them. It's kind of an interesting accounting, by the way, from Abraham's perspective, because Abraham, it's, it, it, you know, it's fire coming down from heaven upon the cities of the plain, it says, Sodom and Gomorrah, for the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham wakes up the next day and he looks down the valley. It's almost as if Abraham was sleeping in his tent that night and didn't hear anything happen. Fire is coming from heaven. And Abraham just looks over the valley and sees it smoking, almost as if he's sitting there drinking his cup of coffee, saying, hmm, I wonder what happened down there. That can't be good. Unless somebody had done something, we would resemble Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because we deserve the same thing. We deserve the very same judgment from God. They were no worse, they are no worse than any of us who have walked the face of the earth. Their sin might have manifested itself in a different way, and yet we are all in that condition. This is the idea behind what Isaiah is saying. What Isaiah is trying to help Israel understand. What God, the Spirit, is trying to help us understand by way of the words of Isaiah to the Jews. We are all in that same place. Unless somebody did something. So Isaiah says, unless who? Unless the Lord, or except the Lord. Lord is that word in the Old Testament that means master. It means that in the New Testament. It's master. Unless... The master. Who's the master? The master of all things. Unless God Himself had done something. By the way, He describes Him here as the Lord of what? Lord of Sabbath. Except the Lord of Sabbath. What is that? You ever stop when you're reading and go, what is that? Lord of Sabbath. It's not even spelled the same way as we see it in the New Testament. Same thing, but, but what is that? Well, the first time you hear of Sabbath is back, way back in Genesis chapter 2. Right at the beginning. The beginning of everything. Genesis chapter 2, when God had finished creating the world and all that was in it. It says that on the seventh day, He rested. Six days God created all things, and on the seventh day He rested. And God carries that reality and the implication of that reality through to the day of worship for the people of Israel, and He calls it the Sabbath day. God had rested on the seventh day from His work, and He carries that along as a day of worship for His people And calls it even the Sabbath day. The day of rest. And that truth is carried on throughout the Scriptures. You see it from Genesis chapter 2 all the way in throughout the New Testament. And is brought into the language of salvation by equating our salvation as entering into rest. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, just go for a moment over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, we studied this some years ago. But just look at it. This is, this is an incredible thing. And it's important for us to just kind of grab this because I want to I draw out an implication that I believe Paul is bringing forward here in those verses in Romans 9. Notice what he says in Hebrews chapter 4. Let's just begin in verse 1. Therefore, let us fear, lest while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of us should seem to have come short of it. So in other words, take care, take heed. You you don't want to assume in some kind of way, in some kind of wrong way, that, that you're in the right place, when in fact you may not be in that place. 
Now that doesn't mean that anyone can lose their salvation, but what he's saying is, listen, we have to be sure we're in that rest. For indeed, verse 2, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, he's implying, just as those in the wanderings of the desert, Israel. But the word they heard didn't profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith. They heard the gospel, they heard what was said, they heard they need to come and believe upon Jesus Christ, but they didn't do that. For we, verse 3, who have believed, enter that rest. Just as it is said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has thus said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. He's putting that juxtaposition in place. God's rested, and yet there's some who aren't going to enter that rest. Since therefore, it remains for some, there's the crumbs, some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter. Why? Because of disobedience. He again fixes a certain day. Today. Saying through David after so long of time. Just as has been said before. Today if you hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts. See the the writer of Hebrews writing was saying. The Jews had a hard time with that. They had a hard time with that reality. Because they thought. That just doing what they were doing was what was required. And the writer of Hebrews even says in verse 8, For if Joshua had given them rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day. There wouldn't have been this other prophecy that said there's another day. So there remains therefore, here it is, verse 9, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered His rest has himself also rested from his works. You see, it's not about working your way into salvation. You can't do it. It's about faith, verse 2. So let us, therefore, verse 11, be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience. Now we could say a whole lot more about that issue. But the idea that I want us to get is this. There is a rest when it comes to salvation. So go back to Romans chapter 9. Because Paul says, unless or except the Lord of Sabbath, unless the Lord of rest, the master of this rest, notice, had left us a posterity. Paul speaking to the Jews primarily. Paul here wanting to convince the Jews. Remember in, in, in the beginning verses, he has this, this sorrow, unceasing grief in his heart con, concerning his own brethren according to his nationality. Speaking to Jews primarily, but oh, how confusing this word posterity is when we read it. Because it sounds when we read it, like it's something from us. The actual definition of that word, if you just look at posterity in the dictionary, gives you the idea of future generations. Future generations would be people who come from us, who are after us. So when you read this in the English, it sounds as if we i.e. the Jews primarily here, but we, those people of God, will be okay with God simply because He has left us future generations of people. Except the Lord of Sabbath had left to us a posterity. We would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, unless there was future generations that took place, we would have no future at all. And while there's some truth to that, I don't believe that's fully what Paul is implying here. 
Because the word in the original Greek for posterity, the translated word into Greek from the Hebrew here is the word sperma. Sperma is the word for seed in the original in the New Testament. Seed. And when you go back to the Old Testament, at the passage that Paul is quoting, which is Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 9, right there in Isaiah's passage, it implies some survivors. Unless God had left us some survivors, a remnant, a, 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 the crumbs. If God had not left us some people, we would have no people at all. We would be like the barbecue bottom in the, in the barbecue that's outside, the embers, the dust that's useless, there's nothing surviving. We would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. In other words, it implies in Isaiah, or Isaiah is saying, the idea of a collective group. And of course, that is true. Unless God had left a sum of national Israel around in some of his dealings with Israel, because judgment was called upon over and over and over and over again, then there would be nobody left. But we have to remember that with all prophecy, and Isaiah is a prophet, he's prophesying to Israel about the future. With all prophecy, there is not only a near fulfillment of that prophecy, i.e. that God would leave survivors of the national Israel, but there's also a far or future fulfillment. And so I believe that Paul, as he's quoting from Isaiah, is not only letting the Jews remember that, in reference to their national posterity. But I think he's also saying to them and to us who are Christians or who believe in God or who ought to believe in God, to people, he's saying that unless God had not brought to us the seed, the seed, all of us would have become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Unless God had not brought to us the seed, none of us would have any hope. In fact, I think this is exactly what Paul is speaking to over in Galatians chapter 3. Go there for a moment. Galatians chapter 3. I'll help you understand why I, why I think there's that implication here in Romans chapter 9. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul is trying to help the Galatians understand that their salvation is by faith alone. There are those who have crept into the church who are trying to say, listen, you can believe in Jesus, but it's Jesus plus works. It's Jesus plus effort. And Paul is saying, listen, that's foolishness. You weren't saved by works. There's no way you're going to be sanctified by work. It doesn't do that. And he speaks to that issue in chapter 3 and, and the reality of, of true salvation comes by faith alone. Verse 6, even Abraham believed in God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he gets down to verse 13 and he hones it down to exactly who this is that we believe in. Christ. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is this reality. You cannot do it. You cannot do it perfectly. You cannot be saved by means of the law. Sure, you can try, you can attempt it, you can do all that you want, but you will always fail. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He became a curse for us. In other words, He not only fulfilled full obedience, but He fulfilled all condemnation, both sides of the law. He was perfect, yet He died for us. He was under its judgment, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that, verse 14, in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, what was the blessing of Abraham? That he became righteous by faith. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. You can circle that word Gentile because that, if you're not a Jew by heritage, that's where you fit. You're Gentile. In Christ, 
the blessing of Abraham, which is righteousness by faith, might come to you, a Gentile, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Go down to verse 16. Now the promise. The promise were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. That's the same word, sperma. To his seed. It does not say, and to seeds, plural, as referring to many, but to one. And to your seed. Who is the seed? That is Christ. 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 Paul says, what I'm saying is this, the law which came 430 years later doesn't invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. It doesn't nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, then it's no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So why the law then? Why the law? We talked about this back in chapter 7. Why the law? Because the law was added because of transgressions, because of sin. Having been ordained through the angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. What's he saying? He said the law was there in order to reveal to you you couldn't do it. That you had a need. That you needed a Savior. That you needed God to do something. That you needed to believe. Because without that, you are going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why the law was there. And it was there so that we would see that until Christ came to whom the promise was made. So go back to Romans chapter 9. Because Paul wants his Jewish brothers and sisters to know that unless God had made a divine choice to save, unless God had sent his seed who is Christ, none of us would be saved. None of us would be saved. We, too, would all resemble Sodom. And Gomorrah. Now that's where the problem lies, isn't it? That's where the problem lies. This is where people have trouble. The problem with the Jews, and the problem with many today who are in the Jewish community who do not believe in Jesus Christ, the problem is not necessarily with Jesus Christ. Now, that may shock you to think like this. But the problem is not necessarily with Jesus Christ, but rather the problem is actually embracing the fact of a guilt before a holy God. The problem is that they don't see a need. And don't get me wrong, the Jews certainly have a problem with Jesus Christ. But the reason they have a problem with Jesus Christ is born in the fact that they already think they're okay. The problem today with Jesus Christ in the minds and hearts of people of our day and age, of people in your own family, of people in our world, is that they don't think they have a need. The Jews thought because of their physical progeny of Abraham, because they were children of Abraham, that that meant they were secure in their relationship with God. They were fine. And Jesus comes along, the seed, the promise of God. He comes along and what does Jesus do? His entire ministry. Jesus keeps poking them in the eye about their need. I just want to show you this. One more passage we need to go to. Go back to John chapter 9. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. But I think this clearly helps us understand and see 
this principle that I'm trying to help us see. You remember the blistering words that Jesus says to the Pharisees in John chapter 9? You know the history of John 9. There's this man who's born blind. He, he's from birth. He cannot see. Jesus comes along and Jesus heals this man who is born blind. And by the way, it happens to be on the day of rest. And everybody's in awe about this, wondering, isn't this the guy who used to sit at the gate and beg for, for alms? Isn't it that guy? And others are saying, no, this can't be that guy, because for them it's just too outrageous as this guy who never could see, now sees. It must be somebody who looks like him, they say in verse 9. And he says, no, no, I'm the guy. Listen, guys, it's truly me. This isn't some fakery. This isn't somebody trying to assume the identity of somebody else like we've seen in our world. They're saying, then how were your eyes opened? And he says, the man who was called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes in verse 11 and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. I went and washed and I received sight. I don't know what happened. All I know is this guy came along, this guy named Jesus, and he made some mud on the ground. He put it on my eyes. He said, go. And instead of me just going, you're an idiot. I shouldn't do that. No, I'm not going to go there. I did it. What do I have to lose? And I went, and guess what? Now I can see. So they bring him to the Pharisees. Verse 14 says, It was a Sabbath day on which Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, the Pharisees are also asking, how is it you received your sight? And he said to them, he applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. Simple little, here's who I was, here's who I am now, and Jesus made it happen. And so some of the Pharisees are saying, this isn't a man of God. This can't be a man of God. Why? Because he's doing things on the Sabbath and that's against the law. No one should be doing anything on the Sabbath. How can this man who is a sinner perform such signs? And so, verse 18, the Jews therefore didn't believe in him. He did, they didn't believe the guy. They didn't believe his story. They didn't believe he'd been born blind. They didn't believe he'd received sight until they called his parents and said, okay, let's hear your testimony. His parents say the same thing. Yep, that's our son. Yep, he was born blind. How he came to see, we don't know. You need to ask him. And they said that because they feared the Pharisees. They feared they would be thrown out of the synagogue. And so they called the guy again in verse 24 a second time. And he says to him, and they say to him, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. In other words, agree with our assessment of this guy who you say made you see. Give glory to God, certainly he cannot be from God. And so the guy answers, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I love that. I don't know about Jesus. You're the theologians. You tell me about him. You tell me what's right and wrong about that guy. All I know is this. A few moments ago, you were like darkness to me, and now I can see your face. That's all I know. And they say, therefore, to him, verse 20, says, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answers, I told you already. You didn't listen then. I've told you the story. I've, it's as simple as that. Why? Why are you asking him to hear it again? Do you want to become disciples of his also? Of course, they revile him. That means insult him. They say, you're, a disciple. you're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. See, we follow the law. That, that, that's what they're saying. That's what following Moses meant. Moses, the law came through Moses. We follow the law. You follow this guy named Jesus. And the man said, well, here's an amazing thing. You do not know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. You're the godly people, and you say you don't know where he's from, but he's the one who did a miracle on me. Isn't this an amazing thing? We know that God doesn't hear sinners. If anyone is God-fearing, he does his will, he hears him, and since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. My story is the first in history. That's what he says to them. 
this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they said to him, you were born entirely in your sins. You are teaching us? How dare you teach us? We know the law. And so they put him out. And here's the part I want us to focus on. 35 to 41. This is, this is incredible. Jesus hears that they had put him out and he finds him and he says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, now this guy is looking at Jesus. Before he was just blind. Here's a guy who says he's Jesus. Puts, you know, now he's looking at him. Do you believe in the Son of Man? He says to him, Who is he? Who is he, Lord? And I may, that I may believe in him. You tell me who he is so that I can have faith in him. Jesus says to him, you have both seen him. I love that. You have seen him. Yeah, you're the guy who did it. You've seen him and he's the one who's talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. There's the exercise of faith and the outworking of that faith being real. He worships Jesus. He doesn't just say intellectually, okay, I believe, see you tomorrow. No, he worships. That's the outworking of faith. And Jesus says, for judgment I came into this world. For judgment I came into this world. So that, here it is, so that those who do not see may see. He's not speaking of physical sight there. He's speaking of spiritual sight. So that those who do not see. So that those who are spiritually blind might see. And that those who see may become blind. In other words, and those who say, I can see clearly. I know what I'm doing. God and I have an agreement. Oh, I'm all good with God. It's okay. I'm good. I follow the law. I do all the things. I can see. That's what the Pharisees were telling this blind guy. Listen, you don't see anything. We see clearly. We know this guy. Says, we see clearly. Jesus says, I came into judgment. I came into this world to judge so that those who do not see those who understand their blindness, those who realize and accept the fact of their blindness may see, and that those who say they're clear and say they see will become blind. You say, how do you know that's the case? Because look at the response of the Pharisees. And those of the Pharisees who were with him heard these things, and they said to him, we are not blind too, are we? They knew he wasn't talking about physical eyes. They knew he was talking about the spiritual reality of their heart. We're not blind too, are we? And here's what Jesus says to them. If you were blind, <laughs> that's the reality. If you understood your condition, if you embraced your condition, if you said, I am blind, you would have no sin. Why does he say that? Not just understanding our blindness, but the reality of understanding our blindness forces us in the direction by the grace and mercy of God to beg for mercy upon God to heal our blind eyes. That's why he says, if you were blind, you would have no sin. Well, he's not saying sin is gone, you'll never sin again. He's saying, listen, the Son has taken the penalty of that. Your blindness is gone. But, since you say, we see, your sin remains. Since you say, I'm okay. Ah, oh, that's good for you if it helps your life, but I'm okay. Since you say you see, since you say you're okay with God, separate from Jesus Christ, separate from believing, your sin remains. You're as blind as pitch black dark. You see, the problem with the Jews is that they refuse to accept their human condition. 
problem with the Jews is that they refuse to see the reality of their spiritual blindness. Jesus is saying, you are completely depraved. You are completely guilty before God. And yet you believe that you're not in that condition. It would have been absolutely foolish for the man born blind to say to Jesus, hey, move on, I can see fine. Sitting there at the gate begging for alms. People would have said, what a fool. The Jews believed that they were okay. And because of that, they hated and rejected Jesus Christ. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying to all of us in verses 30 to 33. You see why I had to develop that up to this point. Because it becomes very clear when we read the words in light of that reality. This is exactly what Paul is saying to us. Exactly what he's saying. And he begins, you notice... With that characteristic questioning reality that we've seen before. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? In other words, taking into account all that has been said up to this point, especially if you're a Jewish person, it would appear to you as a Jew that God had completely went against His own words. It would appear to you that if that's how God saves, if that's how God is going about salvation, then it would appear like before that God just has forgotten what He has said because it seems, according to verses 30 and 30, 30 through 33, that God has taken those who are completely outside of the promise, Gentiles, you and I, those who were the godless pagans, those who we would have looked at and said, oh, those who are eating with Jesus, oh, why does he eat with sinners and publicans? Those kind of people. God has brought close those. And all of those who were highly privileged, all of those who had the oracles of God, all of those who were part of the nation, all of those who, like Paul, were a Hebrew who were of certain tribes, who were born into these families, they had privilege for hundreds of years, seem in God's economy, in their minds, to have been let go. Look what it says. The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness. Implication, like we the Jews pursue righteousness. The Gentiles who didn't pursue it, the Gentiles who didn't care about it, the Gentiles who were as pagan as anything, the Gentiles who were going all the wrong way, somehow received righteousness. They attained to righteousness, not by their own works, even the righteousness which is by faith. The Gentiles who were going, who were in darkness, the Gentiles who were the blind beggars sitting at the gate, could see nothing, were hoping that maybe something might happen. The Gentiles who sinned in ways that we never would think of sinning, those ones got righteousness, which is by faith. But Israel, verse 31, pursuing the law of righteousness, in other words, carrying out the duties and details of the law, like Paul was saying, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. When it came to the law, I was blameless. They didn't arrive at that law. They didn't arrive at the law of righteousness. They didn't achieve righteousness that way. You see the dilemma? You mean to tell me that this carpenter from Nazareth actually opened your eyes? What do you know? We know the law. You see the problem? Same problem that many have today. It's the same exact problem. How can you say, people will say, how can you say, or why would you ever imply or say to me that God will not accept me? I am a good person. Why will you ever say to me, God wouldn't save me? I like God. I acknowledge there is a God. I go to church. 
I walk through the doors of a church faithfully, regularly. In fact, I even pray in times of trouble. When it's troublesome, I pray. Not only for myself, I pray for other people. I'm kind to my fellow man. I, I even help philanthropically. When I see the commercial play on the TV about the dogs in, in some cage, I, I, I have my heart starts to thump and I want to give money to that. I even read my Bible. Don't tell me I'm not saved. I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up under Christian parents. How can you say, I need to be saved? How can you say, I have a need? How can you say that God's going to accept that murderer who's sitting behind bars in jail, who professes Jesus only to get people to like him. How can you say that God's going to save that person? How can you say that the adulteress is going to be saved? How can you say that the person who has come out of a homosexual lifestyle will be saved? How can you say my neighbors are going to be saved who are godless people? How can you say they're going to be accepted and I won't be accepted? How can you say that? Well, they will be accepted if, if they do not stumble over the stumbling stone who is Jesus Christ. Which means, which implies that until you embrace your state of guilt before God, until you recognize the reality that you cannot save yourself, Until you embrace the fact that all of your human righteous deeds are nothing but filthy rags. Until you realize, until you embrace that fact that you are spiritually blind, spiritually dead before God, you will never embrace Jesus Christ. You know why you'll never embrace Jesus Christ until that? Because you don't think you have a need. Matthew 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. He meant bankrupt of soul. Blessed are those who are completely and utterly bankrupt of their soul. You know what, beloved? People need to understand they're lost before they ever will desire to be found. Sin blinds us to the reality of our lostness. That's what it does. Sin is so deceptive, so blinding, so debilitating that it blinds us to the fact that we're blind. We are so blind, we don't even know how blind we are. And so we try to attain righteousness by effort. We try to work our way. We try to stack up our deeds of righteousness in hopes that somehow in the celestial scale that we have created in our own minds that our righteous acts will outweigh our wrong acts and somehow God, being a righteous judge, will somehow accept us on that basis. We're just like the Jews. Just like the Jews who hated Jesus Christ. Paul says salvation is by faith. Faith alone, not by works, so that nobody can boast. You see what he says? Verse 30, the Gentiles have righteousness. Israel doesn't. Why? Why, verse 32? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They pursued it by works because they didn't think they had a need. They pursued it by works. And because they pursued it by works, thinking they didn't have a need, they hated the seed. 
They rejected Jesus Christ. Even though He kept telling them, you have a need, you have a need, you have a need. Right in John 9, if you were blind, your sins would be gone. But because you say, you see, your sin remains. They stumbled, it says, over the stumbling stone. They stumbled over Jesus Christ. For it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Oh, they were offended at Jesus. He was an offense to them because he kept telling them, You have a need. You're lost. You're blind. You have a need. That was offensive to them. It was offensive that God would bring in the Gentiles. Are you kidding me? That offended them. That offends us sometimes, sadly. I can't believe you saved that person. What do you mean you're going to save them? We're like Jonah who goes to Nineveh and God calls him to preach, but he knows God's merciful. And Jonah gets more angry that the plant died and didn't give him shade than God saves Nineveh. That's how we are at times. The Jews stumbled over the stumbling stone. Why? Because they didn't believe they were depraved. But Jesus said, if you were blind, then you would see. Paul's saying the same thing. Listen, my brothers, in the, my brothers by heritage, you need to realize you're blind. You need to realize you can't see. You need to realize you're spiritually dead. Listen, beloved, people die in their sin. Why? Because they refuse to believe. And they refuse to believe their condition of lostness and therefore they refuse to believe in Jesus Christ. The answer to their lostness. The reason we celebrate communion is because we're believers. Believers. Communion is not for unbelievers. This isn't for unbelievers. This isn't a snack before you go home and have lunch. Somebody used to jokingly say to me, I I think we ought to have little submarine sandwiches passed out of communion. I thought, how sad that is. How sad that is. Communion reminds us of our rest in Christ. Communion reminds us of who paid for our sin with his life. Romans 2.4 says that it's the kindness of God that causes you to repent. Do you think that's an interesting phrase? It's the kindness of God that brings about repentance. Now some people say, see, it's the love of God that brings people to repent. No, no. You know what that means there? You only realize God's being kind to you when you know you deserve to not have kindness. The patience of God is waiting and it's calling and it's saying, come. Come to me. I'll give you rest. If you haven't believed, then you must believe. It's commanded. Believe. And the promise of verse 33, the second part, will be yours. He who believes in him. In who? In the stumbling stone. In the seed. In Jesus Christ. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. There is no disappointment with God. So if you're not here and you don't know Jesus Christ, you don't no salvation. It is my plea. It is our plea that you stop rejecting.
Stop rejecting your condition. Stop rejecting salvation. And come. Come to Jesus Christ. That you might be saved. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. Father, once again we bow before you. I trust that what we've heard this morning causes our hearts to think deeply on you, the things of you. I trust that we have not been confused about the condition of our soul. I trust that those here who profess to know you, that we are genuine in that profession and that reflects in our life, not in perfection, but in direction. Knowing that it is the Holy Spirit that produces any good in us in any kind of way and we walk in those good works that you have created beforehand that we might walk in them. We are children of faith. We walk by faith. And so all the glory goes to you for any of it in our life. We thank you for that. And all, Lord, we plead with you. We plead with you on behalf of those who are continuing to reject their condition continuing to reject who they are before you, that they are guilty of their sinfulness, of their life. And because of that, they will not, they refuse to embrace Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would break their hearts, that you would draw them to yourself, salve their eyes that they might see, cause them to be worshipers of you. Thank you for the remembrance of these things in your son Jesus Christ as he hung there on the cross, as he bled and died for us. That we might have life in him. Lord, we acknowledge your sovereignty in it all. We acknowledge our responsibility before you. And we praise you for being the God who saves. Thank you for your patience because of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.